Workforce participation is declining in America, and at the same time, there's an increase in depression related to unemployment. Is there a connection, and what should Christians think about the value of work? David Bonson is here to help answer those questions. He's the founder, managing partner, and chief investment officer of the Bonson Group, and has been named one of the top financial advisors in America by Barron's, Forbes, and the Financial Times. He's a frequent guest on Fox News, Fox Business, and Bloomberg, and his new book is titled Full-Time, Work, and the Meaning of Life. David Bonson, welcome to The Stand Radio. Well, thanks so much for having me. Pleasure to be with you. This is a very unique book because you you bring a strong theological basis to challenge a lot of preconceived ideas about work. Where are Christians missing it when we think about work? You know, I think that it's um, a number of different ways and, and sometimes more than one at a time. But oftentimes there are people who uh, hold to Christian distinctives that where I think their error is in this subject is well-intentioned, but it is coming from a, a sort of closet theological error, and that is the belief that our work is part of some sort of secular or worldly endeavor, and that our uh, ministry efforts are part of a kind of heavenly endeavor, and that what we do at church what we do in the mission field, that these are the areas that matter um, and that work is really sort of in this other category of things that are less noble, less spiritual, and, and less Christian. And while I somewhat understand where it comes from, it doesn't make it, in my humble and charitable opinion, any less dangerous. I think the error there is uh, failing to understand the nature of the kingdom of God, that God, uh, that our work is a part of God's kingdom, that our our uh, efforts in vocation, in the marketplace, in commerce, in education, in, in technology, in finance, in entrepreneurial endeavors, all of these different things that we consider to be work, that these are all things that uh, have profound significance to God and that are a byproduct of what God created us for, that God created us to be productive. He created us to work and grow his kingdom uh, through those earthly endeavors. And I believe that the church needs to recover this message. You make a, a, a strong point of pointing to the Garden of Eden as, as some of the source text where we get this proper understanding of work. Can you give us an overview of what we do learn from creation and from the Garden of Eden? Most certainly. I think one of the most exciting things we learn is a sort of reiteration of perhaps something that we learned when we first became Christians, but kind of forget over time. And that is that God uh, is indeed the creator. And yet we were created to be image bearers of him. We were made in his image and likeness. And that when God told us that in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 1, he went on to tell us what it meant. And what it meant was that we were the unique part of creation that was tasked with co-creating with him building with him, taking the raw materials of the world and going about being fruitful and multiplying and filling the earth, cultivating the earth, uh, caring for the garden, that there was a um, spirit of creativity, of productivity that God himself has that he shared with us. Now, we're still not God. He is God and we are not. And we don't have the ability, try as we may at times, we don't have the ability to create out of nothing. Well, we have not only the ability to do, but the blessing to do is to create out of what God has created. Uh, our ideas, our, our dignified contribution to discovery, to progress, uh, has en enabled us to build truly wondrous things. That's a byproduct of what God created us for. It's an extension of what it means that we are made in his image and likeness. And I think it's a beautiful theological truth, but we have to apply it to what we understand about our work. You've already alluded to the false dichotomy between work and so-called spiritual activity. In what other ways has the fall contributed to our uh, misunderstanding of the importance of work? 
Well, I think that there is a common misperception that work is a byproduct of the fall, that, that work came about because of sin, you know, that before uh, sin entered the world, we were made to vacation. We were made to leisure and recreate and and kind of um, you get this imagery of, of a sort of uh, pure serenity, almost like a, a, a TV commercial for a for a tropical vacation, and that that's what life was to be, Adam and Eve sitting around eating strawberries, and then sitting under the world, and now thorns and thistles came, and we have the drudgery of having jobs. Um, but what we see in Genesis 1 and 2, before uh, we read about sin entering the world in Genesis 3, was that God actually made us to work before sin. It was a blessing. It was creative output. It was, as I said a moment ago, part of a what it means to be an image bearer of God. But of course, it's an incoherent view that work is a byproduct of the curse when we don't view children as a byproduct of the curse. And yet in the two verses before uh, Genesis 3, 19, where it talks about the sweat of our brow being part of our curse, it refers to the pains of childbirth now being a curse that, that Eve and, and her heirs would suffer. And I've never in my life heard any Christian refer to children as a curse. Um, we recognize that children are a blessing, that family was instituted by God before sin, but that because of sin, because of the fall, uh, that now there would be pains of childbirth. And then it goes on to the very next verse, do the exact same logical construction about work, that work existed before fall, work was still a blessing, but now post sin, the curse would be the sweat of our brow, the thorns and thistles. So work and children remain a blessing and the pains of childbirth and the sweat remain the curse. And there is anxiety that can come from work and there is a certain stress. Uh, there can be a physical pain. Um, and those things uh, were not part of God's initial original intention, but grace restores nature and we will spend eternity in heaven without the sweat of our brow as a curse, yet I do believe we will return to a place of work and productive activity, even in the new heavens and new earth. Yeah, that's very good. Uh, in your book, you also write about the increasing levels of despair and hopelessness that we see in our culture today that come from an improper understanding. Could you explain what you mean by that? What about the increased hopelessness that has come about from, well, look, um, th th this is what's so sad is that I think the society at large, outside of the church, has all of a sudden uh, really accelerated a move towards hopelessness, a move towards greater despair, and that the church is not serving as the antidote to that that it ought to. Okay. That what, what, what has happened is uh, so many have said work is dehumanizing, and that having a greater sense of inactivity is somehow more liberating. And then we get shocked when in that boredom and idleness and purposelessness um, that people form drug and alcohol problems and, and mental health problems and loneliness and, and, and spiritual and emotional anxiety. And, and the church ought to be uh, claim, proclaiming the whole counsel of God that there's a joy that comes from those components that we have been given here on earth to make uh, life truly beautiful and meaningful. And those components of faith and family and community and work are all a vital part of a Christian message, a Christian hope. Mm -hmm. But the fourth one is the, the work one is one Christians often seem sort of embarrassed of or afraid to mention that one thing all human beings need, not some, not half, not people who are really smart, all people were created in the image of God. Okay. All people were made to be co-creators with him, not just a select few, not just Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and a few, you know, top students from business school, everybody. And when we are willing to proclaim a message that strips away activity and purpose, we are stripping away dignity. And when dignity gets stripped away, 
there is no possible way this can end any other way but with enhanced alienation, with enhanced uh, anxiety, depression. So these social ills that we're going through as a society are ones we have an antidote for. We have the remedy, but too often we're afraid to proclaim it. What about the criticism that we need to just, you know, we're burned out in our work, so we need to pull back and spend more time with home and family? Is that a really another misunderstanding of how the value of work relates to our calling and our image bearing? Well, I believe in the promises of God, and I believe that he provided a model for us that in this case is rather comprehensive, rather proven, and that I think is um, the answer to burnout. And he said, six days shalt thou work and do all thy work, and the seventh shall be a day of rest. And that mathematical ratio mm. of six to one that God himself modeled in creation and then commanded us to model it, um, I think there's only one of two things that can create burnout. And one of them is not resting as God made. Remember, G Jesus repeated that man was not made for the Sabbath, but Sabbath was made for man. This is a blessing. Rest is something that we have, but we do not work so we can rest. We rest so we can work, right? The, the, the six to one ratio still involves a certain hierarchy, but burnout is avoided if we participate in the work-rest paradigm. But I mentioned there's two things that create burnout. One of them is failing to rest as God has ordained. But I think the second one is an expectation that is unbiblical, an expectation that I should get a three o'clock yoga class every day, you know, seven weeks paid vacation. I'd like to take three months to yacht around Europe before I start my new job. Um, th there is a certain coddling of the society that I think amounts to infantilization. We're treating people like babies. Um, the fact of the matter is that there is a very unrealistic expectation right now as it pertains to the realities of life. Yeah. You know, you're an investment advisor as well. And as part of your work at the Bonson Group, you help people plan for retirement. So clearly you see that as worthwhile. How do you bring this understanding of work into the picture of retirement? Well, it's funny because I, I wish that, um, that, that you're right, that retirement planning is considered a core financial service. And my wealth management firm is engaged in uh, the business of financial services. And yet, uh, what I think the industry means by retirement planning is honestly categorically different than what I mean by it. Okay. Um, I, I regret ever giving the impression to someone that what we're trying to do is achieve a certain sense of financial security for the purpose of them being removed from any productive activity. I see. If the term retirement or the, the process of doing retirement planning was more properly defined as the achievement of financial security, the achievement of financial stability, the uh, um, addition of flexibility, and optionality in decisions one may make with their life, then I'm all for all of those things. I believe in all of them as a legitimate objective in our own stewardship efforts. But I don't believe in retirement as the period of time in which we remove ourselves from any activity. And very often that will mean continuing in some form of what we did vocationally well beyond the period at which we financially need to do it. But I think this idea that, well, once you don't need to work, you ought not to work is an incredibly depressing and dangerous idea and what it messages. And I want to say implicitly, but I honestly think it's a pretty explicit message. If the point of um, working and achieving financial resources is so you won't have to do it anymore, then it effectively means work is something you do to not do it. And, and I think that that really forces one to logically conclude that work has a low value, low meaning, low contribution. We need people of wisdom and experience and expertise in the workforce. We need people that have been, seen a thing or two about a thing or two, as I like to say. And I think that retirement is undermined, both the dignity of the retiree 
but also um, left a hole in many aspects of the marketplace where some seniority would be very valuable. Yeah. There may be some people listening, David, that that would look at their job as as a drudgery. Let's say that they're you know they're they're cleaning restrooms, uh, for an example. And how do you see fulfillment in a job that you see as a drudge and as a chore, maybe a less desirable job? How should a believer view that in terms of God's kingdom? I think let's use your example because it's a very good one. It comes up a lot, and I think it's appropriate about cleaning up a restroom because because I don't think there's a lot of people that would view that as a romantic job right. and and there's maybe some jobs we could come up with that would seem even even a little ickier but not many yeah. and yet what i would say about that um i i think there's a few things that need to be understood here that are not inconsistent with one another they're all true at once number one is that the person who is being paid to clean restrooms is producing goods and services that meet the needs of humanity that they're serving others there is something inherently dignified in a worker who God cares about providing a service to other people whom God cares about, mm -hmm. and that that is what work is. Now, at the same time I say that, that, that work has meaning because it is clearly providing a service for others, it's also true that because of the nature of that work, it is not often work that one wants to do forever that it may be a means to an end. It may be something that it's it's kind of low income. It's obviously low prestige. And yet the work itself still has to be done and it has value. But it's a good job for someone that might not have high skills and high education. There, there's a low barrier to entry. And yet it may be something someone does while they're preparing for something else, while they're expanding other skills to do something that they will enjoy doing more something that they're more skilled at. I don't think those messages are contradictory. There's all sorts of jobs people do that they don't want to do forever, but that when they're doing them, they should be appreciated for what they are, which is the producing of goods and services that meet the needs of humanity. They're enhancing quality of life for someone. They're serving others, and they're having their needs met by meeting the needs of others. Th those things are all true at once, but that perspective is lacking. That attitude is often lacking. And yet I'm not suggesting that someone should be thrilled to be cleaning toilets for their whole life. It's entirely possible someone would be. That they enjoy the, the experience, they enjoy the work, they uh, benefit. It's not a super high stress job. It's kind of a gross job, but it's not super high stress. But there's different, it's a dynamic marketplace. There's a lot of people of different skills and backgrounds and abilities out there. And so even with those menial jobs, I think that the theological truth of what I shared here with you still applies. Uh, great insight onto a, a complex uh, topic, and thank you for doing that. David Bonson is our guest today. He's author of the book, Full Time, Work and the Meaning of Life. You can find out more about David Bonson and the book, as well as other writings, at the website fulltimebook.com, fulltimebook.com. And we encourage you to also visit the website bonson.com. That's B-A-H-N-S-E-N. David Bonson, thank you for your time and for your insight and for writing this book. Thank you so much. 